OK, so I think we can get started. My name is Elizabeth Pendergrass, and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar, Navigating Agile Estimation Challenges. Before we get started, I'd like to make you aware of a few technical items. All of you who are listening to the presentation are currently on mute. To ask any question um, at any point during the presentation, just use the Q&A dialog box shown on the right-hand side of the WebEx screen. We will be using the polling panel today, so it's possible you will need to use the caret symbol next to Q&A to expand the question panel. Laura Zuber will field as many of these questions as she has time for at the end of the presentation. If she does not have time to answer your question, don't worry. I will save all questions we don't get to and refer them to Laura so she can get back to you. She will also share her contact information so you can ask additional questions after the presentation. So I'll start by introducing our presenter today. Laura Zuber has 25 years of experience in software development, consulting, training, and support. She has conducted numerous, she has conducted training and coaching sessions for all Slim Suite tools and helped customers implement Slim across a wide variety of processes and platforms. Laura has managed software development projects, served as a senior software process improvement specialist, performed process assessments, designed and implemented best practices, and authored numerous training programs. She is a certified Scrum Master and Safe Agilist. So without further delay, I'll let Laura get started. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and please confirm that you can hear me OK. I think we can hear you great. OK, good. Thank you. And thank all of you for joining. Every business has challenges, and each business probably thinks theirs are unique. Maybe, but software development challenges are different, mainly due to the need to create reliable products quickly in the midst of rapidly changing technologies and having to jump in often with very little information. Before we get started to address common agile estimation challenges, we'd like to know more about you and your world so I do have a couple of polls. The first one is, what is your software project role? And I'll give you a few seconds to, to respond. Getting a lot of no answer. So. <laughs> I thought about putting other on there so you could fill it in, but I uh, wanted to just keep it simple. Just a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm, go I'm going to uh, close the poll now. Thank you very much for your answers. This will help us. It's uh, saving, so just a couple of seconds, and then I'll show you the results. OK, so you should be able to see the results. We have 90 attendees and 61 responded. All right, let me save this and I will give you one more question. Thank you for your patience. Next question relates to the category of projects that you have. So here's the next one. So which category best describes the majority of projects that you have? Maybe a better way to phrase that.
I'll give you again just a few more seconds for this one. Seems like it's stabilizing. All right, let me close this one and I'll show you the results as soon as it saves. And you should be able to see the results now. I have a lot of, a lot of hybrid, actually more hybrid than agile. That's interesting. All right. So let me save this and we'll get back to our discussion. I asked about your role because software development projects have a variety of stakeholders. Each has their own needs and perspective, and that means their challenges are varied as well. This fact alone is one of the biggest sources of typical estimation challenges. It's hard to get everyone on the same page. There's different goals that are sometimes in conflict, like do it fast and make sure it's high quality, especially early in the life cycle when all of the details have yet to be worked out and assumptions have to be made. Many organizations are at various levels of Agile implementation, as we just saw, or only use Agile for certain project types. So variability here can also create challenges. You may not have thought about it, but there are actually different reasons why we estimate. And this is typically what we find with our, our customers at QSM. If you're an enterprise, large enterprise, your, your company has a strategy that they're trying to implement and that will drive the need of, to estimate, you know, how are we going to deliver these products to address our enterprise strategy? Maybe if you're a systems integrator or someone who's a contractor, you're going to do an estimate to try to win new business. We may simply be wanting to prioritize the backlog. Certainly, we are going to be interested in, for most projects, what is the budget and the schedule? Now, I know for the pure, um, like in the scaled Agile framework, of course, um, we are budgeting teams and trains, not necessarily at the project level. But somewhere, somebody is concerned about the budget. Resource needs. One of the things that um, we've helped customers do a lot is do resource demand planning. Do I, am I going to have enough people when I need them? And then for technical challenges, we also need to estimate to flush out, you know, where do we think, even with just a technical focus, where are the risks going to be and how would we account for those? So before we start navigating through agile estimation challenges, I um, would appreciate your indulgence in just two more questions, and then there won't be any more. Um, so let me load the next question. Laura, just a heads up. I think a lot of people were not seeing the results of the poll. So maybe you could summarize the um, poll responses for everyone from the last two questions, and maybe you could just verbally share the results for this one. Sure. Uh, let me answer the ask this one first and then I'll cover the other two. So this one says, what is your biggest estimation challenge? I'll give you about 10 or 15 more seconds to answer this one. All right, so I'm going to close this question and it's going to take a few seconds to 
tally up all your responses that were submitted. Almost there. Does, do you see it now? The poll results for this one. What's your biggest estimation challenge? Are you able to view it now? I can see it, but just in case, um, it's it's for us, so everyone knows it's uh, the panels on the sidebar. But I think sometimes if people are using the full screen mode, they might not be able to navigate right. like that as easily. So right. maybe just you could summarize in case people can't. Find Absolutely. It. So we've got thirty set. Uh, the what the majority is um, initial scope not well defined by a large margin. The second is scope changes. Um, the third is tied between other and team or train velocity. And then the last one is not enough time to perform the estimate. So that doesn't seem uh, to be much of an issue. On the previous question, the are you mostly agile? Are you mostly waterfall or hybrid? Uh, hybrid came in first. Uh, followed by Agile, and then there still were some waterfall. Um, the ones for the role, I don't um, fully remember all of those <laughs> responses because I can't see them anymore, but um, that one was for, um, I had a lot of, of Scrum uh, team members. There were a lot of people who were um, uh, project managers or in the business area, so those were the top three, I believe. And um, if we can, we'll see if we can share these poll results um, later. The last question that I will uh, ask you, please, is... what? How would you rate your visibility of project estimates, and that's namely the assumptions upon which they are based. How do you do you see them? Do you know where they came from? Still getting a lot of responses, so I'll give you a few seconds. All right, I'm going to close this poll. Thank you again for taking time to do that. And I hope you could see from the results that, you know, when we say agile, <laughs> that could be, that could, there has a lot of variability just there as well. So if, if you are seeing the poll result, results, great. If you're not, um, then the, no surprise, medium, medium visibility into estimate data or assumptions is uh, the biggest answer followed by high, which is good. That's actually very good. Again, that will depend on your role. Um, and uh, then low visibility was the lowest response. All right. So now let's start walking through what some of these challenges are. Again, scope not well defined was uh, a pretty high response with the poll. But the title of this slide I want to point out is not Agile Estimation Challenges for two reasons. The software development challenges that I will describe are not unique to Agile methods or organizations. And estimate challenges are really life cycle management challenges across all the stages, estimation, tracking and forecasting, and closeout. But here's what they are. Scope not well defined, <laughs> right? And that's just a challenge that will never go away because we're called upon to produce estimates early in the life cycle when we don't know very much. So it's one we're just going to have to learn to deal with. The scope and or size measurements are inconsistent, maybe across different application types, uh, maybe across different 
parts of the organization. In Agile particularly, there may not even be an agreement on the need to estimate. Velocity and or productivity is either unknown and or it fluctuates or it's in fluctuation. Um, most people will readily admit that velocity is not constant um, and that's something that we always deal with. It may stabilize, um, but it's never a constant. Historical data is not available, is a challenge. We always want to base estimates on what our known capabilities are. In the Agile world, um, particularly when some folks talk about history, they mean just the prior sprints in a certain release. You know, that's history at that team, very small level. Higher up in the organization, history would be, you know, data on pro similar projects that we've completed in the past. And that, at both levels, that can be uh, challenging to, to get that information. Assumptions regarding time and effort trade-off. This is something specific that um, to SLIM that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Many folks don't understand what we've been modeling for over 40 years, and that's a non-linear relationship between time and effort. And tracking and forecasting. That's probably being done at various, again, degrees of process maturity and visibility. Um, just because we estimate and have a plan doesn't mean that that's how it's all going to turn out. So that ability to um, look at plan versus actuals and make adjustments accordingly is a big part of, um, you know, reforecasting is reestimating. And then finally, looking at measure the deliverable quality, the deliverable itself, the value we're giving to the customer. Do we know that just because we said it was going to, you know, be a three month release, uh, the three months is up, is it, is the product really ready at the quality we, we want it to be at. So I would say that I've highlighted in blue here the ones that are more prone to be challenges in the agile development world. So let me, for those of you who are not familiar, let me describe the SLIM approach and that will give you a background for um, the rest of the the ways that I'm going to show you that those challenges can be addressed. The SLIM suite of tools uh, is covers the whole entire life cycle. That's what SLIM stands for, Software Development Lifecycle Management. So, of course, SLIM estimate is our main flagship tool. We can get in very early, do feasibility estimates, flush out unrealistic expectations, and then later on, as we do get more information and the scope is better defined, then we can update those estimates and do more um, uh, refinement. What we're getting out of SLIM estimate is a notional plan of various metrics and how they're going to play out over time, like a product build-up chart, which would be your, in the Agile world, your build, you know, your build-up chart or drawdown, however way you want to look at it, and other uh, plans like staffing plans. So Slim Control then is our tracking and forecasting tool for in-flight projects, in-flight releases. As we're going through, we're going to, for smaller projects on a weekly basis or at a Larger project on a monthly basis, track plan versus uh, actuals versus plan. And based on where we are for actual performance, then we can reforecast. Slim Data Manager is our historical data repository. A very big part of the estimation process, again, is to sanity check estimates against history and base our, you know, get some of those assumptions we're making about productivity and size and time and effort. Get that from history. We use the, um, the big part of SLIM is, a, of course, our QSM industry database. We use Data Manager for our own database, and the best practice then is for our customers to gather just a few projects and, and use that for themselves. The great thing about that is you, we can uh, pull that history into our estimation tool and sanity check our estimates against past performance. And then SLIM Metrics is the tool that we allows us to do benchmarking and performance analysis so we can make some improvements. But one of the main things it helps us do is create these statistical trends 
that, again, can be pulled into the estimation tools and help you get things like uh, a T-shirt sizes for your own completed projects. Um, the industry trends within SLIM Estimate are going to be produced by us from our data using SLIM metrics. And then just very quickly, SLIM Master Plan is part of the estimation process that allows us to model complex projects and or portfolios. I'm going to show you uh, a, a little bit about that later on. And SLIM Collaborate is our online internet-based tool where the purpose is to bring in more of those stakeholders, right? We've got people who need visibility into the estimation process. We can do that with an online tool, centralized database, and it has workflow, workflow components. So just very quickly, that's our um, suite. And I'll be looking at the three estimation tools primarily um, later in this presentation. So again, just continuing with some SLIM fundamentals. The software production equation is at the heart of SLIM tools and developed by our founder, company founder, Larry Putnam Sr. To deliver value to our customers and or management, we need to apply some amount of effort over some amount of time at some level of productivity. And I would uh, think of it more as a um, an efficiency number. For straightforward estimate calculations, the inputs are size and productivity, and the outputs are time and effort. So we're traditionally, at, with a top-down scope-based approach, we are calculating the effort required. We are not going to put in effort. Um, but this equation can be rearranged and we can take what we know to solve for what we don't know. That's why I listed those different purposes of an estimate is because we are different wizards, our different ways of approaching the problem provide a different strategy for doing an estimate based on what the purpose is. For example, our time boxed fixed team approach uses the assumptions about effort and time, right? If we've got a fixed team, they are stable team, well, then we know what the effort is over a certain, let's say, cadence, a release of three months or a program increment. Those two are fixed. They're not going to change. We make an assumption about productivity. So what we're calculating in this case is the size. How much functionality or value can be delivered by this team in this time frame at this productivity level? And that's just one example. SLIM's productivity is actually, we call it the productivity index, and it's not a traditional li linear measure like sprint velocity. It measures the efficiency of your development environment, not just the people, and it's calculated from completed projects. It includes a, a host of factors, which some can be quantified, some cannot, like personnel factors, and that's not just the team. That means the morale, the experience, the management, personnel, all of that. Technological factors, tools, infrastructure, language, process factors, maturity level, and product factors. I mean, is this complex? And then, and then actually reuse. So I'd like to walk you through just this example so you can understand it a little bit. We've got two projects, Project A and Project B. They are the same size. It happens, this just happens to be function points. It could be stories. It could be features, whatever. They both used the same amount, expended the same amount of effort in, in hours. And But Project A threw a bunch of people on the project, six people, and got it all done in one month. Project B was on the other end of the spectrum, if you will. They only put one person on this project, <laughs> poor soul, and it took six months. So the traditional notion of productivity provides absolutely no insight to exactly what happened on this project. The number's the same. The productivity index in SLIM, and again, I know you're not that familiar with the numbers, it, it is, first of all, it is a unitless number, which is handy. It 
ranges from one to 40. Technically, most of the numbers are going to be between, let's say, eight, nine, and 10, and around 28, depending on project type. So a, a PI difference of 1.0 is a fairly significant. So going from, a, let's say, 16.4 to a 17.4 would, would maybe take a while if you were going to do some process improvement efforts. Um, so this difference of 10 is actually uh, quite, quite large. Notice also that we have this other variable or metric here. This is mean time to defect, and it's the, our reliability number. This tells you, or we can predict for you, what will a quality can you expect based on the way you're choosing to run your project, right? These are choices. The time and effort is, is that we're talking about here is a choice, and I'm going to show you the impact in, of that in just a minute. Just real quickly, the, um, the relationship between the core metrics is one thing that we model in SLIM. So we're staying high level. This Just that fact of only using core metrics of uh, total release or project duration, effort, and defects, and then a productivity at that project level as well. These are all you can see plotted against software size. A couple of things to notice. Except for productivity index, all of these plots are log-log. So that means that the straight line is actually a curved line. So small changes in the size can have a dramatic effect on what the effort and the time are going to be. And notice, that, of course, they all increase with size. That's probably intuitive to you, except for productivity. You may not have thought that productivity also increases with size, but we find, again, with 40 years of collecting the data that that, that trend has continued to take place. This is the, an example of the entire QSM database, which you would never use really in an estimate. Um, so we've, we have multiple trend lines by application type. There's much less variability, and so the trend lines are specific to the kind of work that you're doing, and they're a great source of assumptions, again, early on when you don't have a lot of information. This is an example or shows you the time and effort trade-off and the fact that it's it's not, not linear. Um, you know, projects can be scheduled and staffed in different ways, but for a given project, time and effort are never completely independent. And that's because software is development is not manufacturing. I can't just go, you know, doubling my team does not cut the schedule in half. So for the same project, let's assume some size, maybe it's that 300 function point project. And if I have an assumption about productivity, I'm not going to change either one of those, then anywhere on this red curve is a potential solution for how I could choose to run my project. And that's oftentimes a business decision. Now, each application has a minimum development time. And so one thing using those trend lines does is help you see um, where you might be in the impossible zone. I don't care how many people you throw on the project, you can only compress the schedule by so much because of the size of the application. That's that project, uh, that's project A, perhaps. They were uh, nearing that. The other extreme is you can't take so long to deliver a project that you miss your marketing window of opportunity or to make, you know, your client happy. So what the, what Slim helps you do is understand what is realistic and stay within that area. But then, and that would be this green line, but you still have a lot of choices on how you choose to run your project. So that is uh, all there is on the, the, the background. So just to, again, help you understand the, where the framework for what I'm going to show you in the tools. So let's talk about agile estimation challenges particularly. QSM customers, you know, have shared their agile estimation challenges over the years. So we wanted a way to create a way for them to share their ideas and get help from QSM also. So we conducted a several month long forum with customers in 2018 called the Agile Round Table. It's my Arthur, King Arthur little image there. 
And the majority of discussion was related to sizing. How should we size agile projects during an estimate and even in those other uh, life cycle stages I mentioned for tracking and then when the project's over? Some folks uh, in, on, that were participating said they liked function points because it, it is a standard. What does that address? It addresses that inconsistency issue and it's platform agnostic. Now, we all know that function points are not applicable to every project, but where you could use them, a lot of, most of our customers are building business applications, and it's a pretty good place to start. Other folks who participated in the roundtable said that story points was best for a customer satisfaction reason. And I think what they meant there actually was their internal their internal customers, the agile teams themselves, of course, prefer to, to do it this way, and that makes perfect sense. But the challenge is inconsistency. Um, agile by design promotes the fact that each team should come up with, you know, their own definition of a story point. Um, I will just share with you and highlight the quote here by Andy Berner, who is one of our development principals at QSM. Even though we're not trying to be consistent, it will work out that we are. So I would uh, challenge you to go back if you haven't already taken a look at, you know, over the last few years or several projects, what were actually the scales, uh, the number of points per most of your stories and do some analysis. Um, the big thing that has that has come out and even the scaled agile framework folks would tell you this um, you have if you want to really improve your estimation across an organization uh, you you will have to give um, some consideration to putting in a standard practice the uh, big rock sizing I won't talk about very long that's just uh, one of our uh, participants in this panel wrote a paper it's available on our website and so he, explains how to size epics based on relative sizes of, of stories and, and epics that you've built before, probably not new to many of you. And then lastly, another challenge with software sizing in Agile particularly is the fact that we're still dealing with estimates. Um, I've mentioned already in explaining Slim Control as our tracking tool and Data Manager as our history, that what we're after in both of those parts of the life cycle is some actual measure. What, okay, we made an assumption about size, but how big are these things we're actually building? And when we, a lot of organizations do story, not all, but most, estimate in story points, then when the delivery is done, they don't, nobody goes back and updates the story point count. We just say this is what we delivered. And so we're dealing with what we call estimate and estimated, estimated actuals. And that, that's okay if that's all we got. And if we're consistent, that will work. But I just wanted to point that out as it's a lot of times we're still, if we're dealing with story points only, we're not really getting an actual measure. So how can we address that in SLIM? SLIM is extremely flexible when it comes to measuring size. Different methods are appropriate for different kinds of projects and at different points in the life cycle. This um, t-shirt sizing over here, I know it's very small, uh, we call that sizing by history, is based on those uh, statistical trends that I pointed out earlier, either industry data or your own, and it lets you create defensible estimates when you don't know very much. So that, that challenge of scope not being well-defined is one of our biggest ones. We can come in early on. If we have some history, then, and again, industry or your own, then these T-shirt sizes are automatically calculated for the range of projects in your historical database. Now, once you get some more information and you start breaking your epics down into stories, if that's your solution uh, size unit of choice, then we can look at and even quantify complexity. I've got just not just a bunch of stories. I've got some that are large, some that are average, some that are small, and got some throw-ins. So we start to really get a better handle on the scope. Um, 
What you can also do is, if there are scope changes, then it's very easy to come in and say, okay, I thought we had 10 average story. Actually, there's 15 now. And, and boom, you've got an updated estimate uh, right away. So challenge met, scope not well defined, and scope changes. Let's take this a little bit further. Um, I wanted to look at how we can determine the, actually the size of your stories. Like, again, what is a story and how big is it and what is an epic in our world? We can look, take that information from a tool like JIRA. Slim has an API used to prototype this integration and we could build an integration to another tool. So this is just an example. There are many ways that organizations use JIRA. So QSM could work with you to map out what your data needs are. So again, this is just one single example. But what we have here is a, a user story map of the hierarchy of epics and stories, multiple levels of medium to small stories. Early on, only some of the epics are refined, right? So these two have been broken out, and then these two haven't been refined yet. And that's the state of the data in JIRA. So what do we do in the integration? Well, we can take the story points for each of the leaf stories, you know, right down the path here, add them up, and get the size of these epics in story points. We can make the assumption that the epics that have not been refined are about the same size. We can categorize each of these stories to a size bin based on the story point count. Again, saying what is, uh, what is medium, large, or small. Let me get rid of this. And then add up the individual stories. So when we do all that, you get this screen, which I've already shown you twice. <laughs> Um, this looks very like, very much like what I showed you just a second ago. There, in, uh, one's in in Slim Estimate, one happens to be in in Slim Collaborate. But this is actually we've calculated from your own data the size of your epics, which ones have been refined, which ones haven't. How big is an average story for you? How this here says that it's your small stories on average are two point seven six story points. Well, how many of them do you have? You have 103. So with that kind of an integration, we can take what you already have and pull it in. So if you're trying to deliver this release containing all of this functionality, then you get the total story points. So that's the history on sizing because, again, for a scope, for estimating, everything depends on size. So ignoring size can be a problem. That's the great thing about Agile. Uh, the, most Agile organizations recognize that. Um, so that's a challenge all by itself. What I'd like to talk to you about now is just highlighting the estimation and then quickly tracking and forecasting and then um, close out. So let's talk about estimation because that's really the title of this main talk, isn't it? So we've already said that estimating size is our biggest challenge and um, the fact that effort and cost and time are driven by size. So one of SLIM's greatest benefits is the ability to explore a range of potential outcome and do what we call what if analysis. What if scope is bigger than we think? We can anticipate if scope changes are also a problem, we can look back and say, well, what is it typically with this customer? Um, they typically increase the scope about 20%. Well, then you can very quickly run that scenario. What if we're not as productive as our initial assumption? What if staffing changes or the budget's cut? You get the idea. Our strength of our approach is the ability to run these different scenarios very quickly, compare them to one another, and identify the risks. Add to that a Monte Carlo simulation, then we can, you know, we're dealing with uncertainty. We all recognize that. We can't get rid of it, but if we, but we can measure it and manage it. And so we use it to compute a range of uh, probabilities for each of these potential outcomes. And what that allows us to do is to determine 
the amount of contingency, either, you know, extra budget or extra time, what contingency do we, are we going to need to mitigate those risks because we've anticipated them ahead of time? So let's look at each of the three estimation tools. This is an example of what a agile release estimate would look like in SLIM estimate. We're modeling what the fit with SLIM tools with agile development is at the release level. We've got two major groups of activities. What this is, this story here is called story writing. That is breaking in the JIRA example, that's breaking those epics out into the stories and, you know, somebody's got to do that work. This build, uh, block here, and this is a staffing chart. We've got the team size on the y-axis and calendar on the x-axis. The build is the designing, the development, the testing um, of all of those stories. The What we call a high degree of overlap here is the fact that we're modeling doing all this every every increment or every sprint, right? And then we may stop towards the end to do some release management activities. The staffing profile, um, one thing we model it in SLIM when it's appropriate for you that are doing waterfall and hybrid is the fact that we we may ramp up with the staff. We may not start with the full team um, for the first few days or weeks. And so if you're interested in that, um, let me know and I'll tell you what that's all about. Um, I'm not actually going to be showing that today, but that is an option if you're not pure agile. Um, that's definitely a big part of our, our history. So imagine those, uh, and what you see up here, these are increment lines. Um, we, you can call them sprint lines. You can call them whatever you want. And this is an, a new feature of our latest release. And this line that looks a little bit different here is supports a scaled agile approach if you're, if you're using one you could have two levels of increment lines. So this might be, if you're in a scaled agile framework, this might be a program increment, right? Every every five sprints there or thereabouts, then we're going to do our release planning again. And you can imagine with those those what if scenarios we want to run that we need our project, you know, our project schedule's gonna grow and shrink. So what you can do here is very quickly determined based on those different scenarios, what is the number of sprints required for each one? And you get specific data about that with the uh, data behind these charts. So the master plan models a scaled agile methods. A couple of years ago, I did a webinar on uh, exactly this, so, and that's on our website, and I would point you to that, or you know, or you can ask questions, but that uh, webinar would be a good place to start. What you're looking at here is several program increments, and this is probably just one team. This is a very simplistic example. Uh, we can these are estimated in SLIM estimate. We pull them in here. And what SLIM master plan allows us to do is account for other parts of the project or program that may not be software or they have a schedule or a cost impact. And there may be dependencies, um, particularly in a very large organization um, doing scaled agile. There are going to be dependencies um, Many, can be many dependencies. So this just gives you an idea of how we can, it's a very flexible hierarchy. We can um, include a lot of things other than just software, and we can get a really good picture of what's going on. Slim Collaborate is, again, our online tool built to uh, implement some workflow if you want to and include other stakeholders. Like you might have someone who needs to come in and approve an estimate. Estimation is not their day job, but they're part of the process. There's a central database here. You can filter and group and, and use keywords to, um, you know, look at the list of projects that you want to look at. And then when a person logs in, their list is actually going to be specific to the projects that they need to work on based on their role and their um, permission level. 
Notice that under this stage column here, we have something called, we have estimates. So we have estimation projects and we have closeout. Closeout is those history projects. So you can have your estimates and your history in one place. You can pick and choose relevant projects to support an estimate, right? So I've got an estimate and I can go compare it to the history that's like this project. Um, I can tag projects with keywords, so really quite flexible. And just one more one more thing to give you, <laughs> that's just a list of projects, and you're like, yeah, well, what are, what are you going to show me? Well, Slim Collaborate specializes in what we call project intelligence, and we, there are four different dashboards. This is, uh, well, this, no, this is a project dashboard. We, um, we have a portfolio dashboard, which shows the metrics of the projects that you would have on that filtered list on the prior screen. And you can go in and benchmark performance, get a range of project sizes, and like I said, compare them to estimates. This is a project dashboard. So for each one of those estimation projects, we can look at the cumulative cost of our estimate in orange against something that may be more realistic and we can run those multiple scenarios and log them and do a comparison. We can sanity check our estimates against either, again, industry trend marks or our own. Um, and you, you can pull together the kind of information that you want to look at uh, based on your needs. So challenge met here is productivity with all three of these is that productivity and the other assumptions are based on history and they account for the fluctuations across increments because it's a project level productivity in the uh, number and you can see the impact of the time and effort trade-offs here in real time. Let's take a quick look at project tracking. This view is a typical uh, time series chart used for tracking. We do have an agile template for slim control. What you see is examples of a one build up chart and one burn down chart. We've got plan is the line in blue. As the project has progressed over the weeks, we've got actuals in red. And then, you know, based on where we are today, we're a little behind. So where are we going to be? And then the forecast is the green line. So we're going to need, you know, a couple of more sprints to get this one done. And again, the sprint lines are here and it, it tells you that. This is those epics being, so this is just an example of a core metric that we, that we entered in there. And again, you could measure, very flexible, you could measure whatever you need to measure. But this is that process of defining the stories because we got to, we have to be ahead of that um, so that the, Someone can go and grab what they need off of the product backlog, right? And so then, and then getting those done. Let's talk about the forecasting because that's the a real strength of Slim Control. We provide three different forecasts because you may need to do some more planning or update your plan. When a project goes off track, the curve fit forecast, the first one, offers a mechanism for, like the other tools, performing that what-if analysis. You can go in and, and put in your scope changes. What Now that we know that it's bigger, and let's reforecast on that. We don't need to go back to the estimate because now we have a real productivity that we can measure for this project real time because of, of a few um, reporting periods worth of information. You pick the metrics that you think are the best predictors for where you're going to end up, and it will calculate a new end date for you. The trade-off forecast is a different kind of forecast, and that's where you are simply focusing on the impact of changing the staffing. What if we brought in three more people? Would that really help us? The maintenance forecast is a special forecast that you, you don't run until you've... Uh, release the product, and let's say you have a warranty period or you want to clean up latent defects, improve the quality, you can iterate on a completion date based on your quality goals. Another really valuable tool or feature within uh, the tracking and forecasting tool, a slim control, is 
taking your defect data, defects discovered, again, on this in-flight project, and SLIM has a default quality model built in that may or may not fit the way you do things, so we can adjust the model to fit what's happening on your project. You Maybe be, you have really good processes. Maybe you just ha- your process is different. It's not good or bad. It's just different. And so we can dynamically adjust the defect prediction model based on the defects that you're finding, which is I'd be, I should have asked a poll uh, how many of you actually, you know, are really tracking defects very closely. I'm sure a lot of you are. But reporting that and looking at it and then basing a forecast on making sure we produce a good quality gives you a lot more visibility here. So all of those kind of forecasts together and adjustments, then again, like look, modeling and, and calculating multiple estimates, we can calculate multiple forecasts, decide which one is the best predictor for us, and then we can choose to make that forecast a new plan. So challenge met visibility of project status at regular increments, scientific forecast based on multiple metrics with the choice about which metrics are the best predictors and measuring deliverable quality. So lastly, let me talk about project closeout and that's synonymous with gathering historical data. Data Manager, as I showed way early on, is our historical data repository, but it works so is Collaborate. They both contain historical data. Now, with the high-level, scope-based approach for the entire life cycle, we're sticking with core metrics. That's what allows us to do an analysis and comparison of multiple projects, but it also means there's not a lot of data. We're not talking about gathering a lot of data here. Um, where we can, this is actually, this is actually a snapshot from Slim Control, where we would have planned start and end date for those major blocks of activities. And we're going to track, well, did we actually start these sets of activities on time? Um, and when did we actually end them? So, if we've been using slim control all along, then gathering history is about a three second process because you simply import your completed slim control project into data manager um, and you're finished. But even if that's not the case, uh, this is uh, shows you what the data manager project, a single project screen looks like. You can measure with custom metrics, you can measure well over 300 uh, metrics in Slim Data Manager out of the box without adding custom metrics of your own. Minimally, what you need to, and you get a lot of benefit from it, is minimally what we're after probably is that productivity index, right? We can get that with having the time and effort for construct and test. That's minimally what we need. How much, how many person hours? Dates are best, but if we don't have the dates, then we can simply input the time and months. And we, this is where that actual size comes in, not only, again, with tracking and forecasting, but at the end, with those, that little bit of information, then the productivity index, as you can see, is calculated. Defects, again, if we, if we're tracking defects, um, and then, then the defect tuning factor will be calculated for you automatically. The other thing that's really nice, um, it you can do it manually. Again, it will be automatic for you if you've been using Slim Control and you pull your projects in, is a lot of people are interested in how predictable are we? How good is our estimation process? And you can see here we've got a range of, we, we know immediately by percentage what our overruns and slippages have been. How do the estimates and the actuals compare? And then you can also put in your own narratives and rank and provide all kinds of lessons learned here. So I would en- encourage you to think about that, particularly as soon as some of your releases or projects are over, you know, have a quick little lessons learned because once people move on to the next thing, uh, it'll be hard to go back and capture what it, what actually happened. So challenge met here is again, more visibility, 
We've got historical data as a basis of estimation. We're measuring final deliver, delivered quality, and we're calculating a productivity index to support our future estimates. And lastly, let me just point you to the QSM website if you're interested in learning more. We've got lots of white papers and blogs and webinars and other resources specific uh, to Agile. This Agile Estimation Beyond the Myths is a webinar by the gentleman Andy Berner that I mentioned. It's very good. It's a two-part webinar. The roundtable articles are all published there if you're interested in some of the details that I summarized for you. And again, just... Um, just go and take a look around or, or let us know if you have any specific questions. Thank you so much um, for your time. I've left a few minutes, I hope, to answer any questions that you may have. If you are a, um, a, a PMP certified and you're interested in Project Management Institute PDUs, then here's your claim code for today's webinar. And with that, Elizabeth, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Laura. And just so everybody knows, we will have a replay available and I will send a link to that as soon as we have it up on our website. So we have a lot of great questions and we could go a few minutes over if you guys have time. Um, I'll start with one question that I believe was about the time effort trade-off slide. Um, one person was asking, with the red curved line, it looks like time goes up as effort goes down. That seems counterintuitive. Would you please explain that? Let me see if I can quickly get there. Mm. So as effort goes up, Efforts going up on the y-axis, time is decreasing. So what we're saying here is that in order to compress the schedule, um, you plan to deliver this product in six months and uh, somebody comes in and says, you know what, we need it in four, then you're, you're going, you're saying, okay, I have to cut it off at four months you know, six was out here, um, then that's, that's going to take you a little bit more effort. And this, you know, for small projects, this is where scope changes for small releases has a greater impact than anyone anticipates. Um, I was talking with, you know, a customer lately that had a project that was, let's say, around four months, and they just wanted to cut off a couple of weeks. That's a big deal. And, and, and it can be shocking. We had a number of questions about MTTD, uh, mean time to defect. Uh, a couple of people were asking if you could explain the unit of measure or how that's calculated. Maybe just give a more detailed yeah. de definition. Sure. So um, if we are um, tracking the defects that we are encountering as during development, we call that defect discovery. And what SLIM's gonna predict is how many defects should I expect to find for the project as a whole, but each reporting period, so every month or every uh, week, it would say, you know, based on where you are in your development phase, you should have discovered and found um, and hopefully fixed, um, you know, 30 defects this reporting period. So mean time to defect is the amount of time, so the mean time, the average time, that the system itself will run between the occurrences of defects. So how long can it run before it hits a defect? Because it will run longer if there's only five in there. It will hit a defect much quickly if there's 100 in there. So it's the reciprocal of the defect discovery rate. And it doesn't even come into play until system testing and later in the life cycle when we actually have a in fully integrated operating system. Good question. Do you have any experience using cosmic function points? I've used them to count from user stories, but I don't have much history. I personally don't. Um, I know of a, a couple of people who, who do. Um, I have the folks that I've talked to, 
if you're actually think they're very applicable if you're doing um, data science kind of work and um, data manipulation. Uh, they seem to, what I've heard, they seem to fit that well. I'd be happy to get some more information for you. I do know of a technical paper that I read myself. I can just, you know, if, uh, if I know your email address, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, so I, I don't have any personal experience, but I can get you some information if that will be helpful. But I would encourage you to use, to use them if you can. I've used the Slim Suite for a number of years. We are still ramping up in our experience with Agile or Agile hybrid projects mm -hmm. due to the challenge in obtaining project size at the front and project history at the back from Agile project teams. Any advice? Well, and that can be again. It's it depends on your your role and where you are in the organization. And if you're not even if the the agile team is not part of your group and you're not part of the team and they're very secretive, which does happen, and they don't want to share the data or no one's told them to share the data, then it can it can be very challenging. Um, I would say. You know, do, do the best you can internally with your organization to promote the benefits of sharing that data. And, you know, tell them if you'll just share your data, I'll, you'll do the analysis and make the most sense out of it. In lieu of that, then, you know, what you can do is use the QSM industry trends and you'll be very close and you'll have a very good defensible estimate um, starting there. And as you can, supplement that with the history you can get your hands on. Okay, I think we probably have time for just a couple more questions. I've had a question about the slides as well. We will have um, those available for download alongside the webinar replay. Uh, let's see. Um, sorry if I missed something here. There was a question uh, about whether function points and story points are inputs to the tool to derive estimates. Absolutely, yeah. So size is a very key input because it's it we're we're estimating based on scope. So um, you know, when I teach a class on our tools, we have a discussion about the the difference between a top down and a bottoms up. So what most people do is what we would call a bottoms up estimate. They're in a spreadsheet. They've tried to list either all the modules or all the tasks to be performed. There's some sort of list of things to do. Um, and we estimate the time and effort for each one of those tasks. And then we roll it all up and, um, it has challenges. First of all, size, and a lot of times, and again, Agile is a little bit different here, but if you're still doing hybrid projects, size is, may not even be explicitly accounted for in that bottoms up approach. And so ignoring size, there's a, a go to the QSM website and search on infographic. And if you do that, we have a sizing infographic. It's kind of like a poster. And it it will give you a very good place to start to look at the impact of size and why estimating size is important. Um, whether you use, I hope it was clear that whether you use story points or function points, that's just a matter of, you know, A, what kind of data can you get your hands on? Um, or B, um, you know, you can you can actually estimate it both ways and see how they both come out. But ignoring size is is going to make your life difficult. And so, um, but it is challenging. So, yes, you need size. And and again, if you have more questions about that, we're glad to answer them. Okay, I think we will do one more question. I have a couple other questions that are follow up questions to things that you were discussing. So we will comb through these and direct all of these to Laura and sure. follow up with you guys just to make sure that everything was clarified. Um, one last question, I think you already discussed this, but I think it bears repeating is just what is the definition of PI and how is that calculated? Sure, um, so productivity index is an efficiency of your development environment. So, um, because it's computed, mm, it's computed based on looking at how much time and effort did you spend 
to deliver a certain amount of functionality. That's, 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 so it, it, it accounts for your whole development environment and what influences it. The complexity of the application influences it. The personnel influence it. Um, the, the fact that you may be brand new to Agile will influence it, right? You would be less productive than maybe you used to be because it will take time to implement new processes that will slow you down. You could be uh, in the government as opposed to being in the commercial sector. Government data, you know, but there's a lot of red tape and it may slow us down. So there's a lot of factors that go into play. And instead of having a lot of switches where you go in and, 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 and you try to rate those things, we don't try to do that. We just measure what it happened to be. And your environment, development environment, really rarely changes quickly at all. So the PIs you demonstrated last month and last year will be very much relevant to what you're trying to estimate today. They just don't change very quickly. So that's why it's a valuable number. And the fact that it's unitless, again, you don't have to explain to anybody where you got it. Great, well, I think this has been a great Q&A and um, once again, I will make sure and direct all questions to Laura so everything is clarified. And feel free to follow up with us. Um, info at qsm.com is our general email, so we will receive any questions that you send that way. Um, and please feel free to visit our website and check out more of our Agile resources. And um, here's the code again if you need it. Yes, thank you, Laura. And stay tuned, I will have a replay available for you guys within uh, the next week or so. So thanks again for attending and thank you, Laura, for a great presentation today. Thank you all, yes. Bye-bye. <laughs>